Yeah, I mean, you know, we all kind of <clears throat> fell into the trap in over the last three or four years of, of really sort of tying everything that's happening in early stage investing around <clears throat> these ideas of demo days and accelerators and creating, you know, a, a, a host of sort of sub $100,000 or sub $200,000 companies and then having them all go out and present and then a subset of them getting funded. And of course, you know, there's nothing sort of exceeds like excess in early stage investing. And so everybody created an accelerator and there was just now this huge problem of, of many, many, many of the companies flowing out of these accelerators no longer able to obtain Series A financing, which is probably good macroeconomically speaking. You get sort of more experimentation going on in the economy, but bad as a startup founder because the likelihood of you getting funded it's asymptotically approaching zero. Yeah, I, I remember uh, during the, the dot-com bubble, incubators were the hot thing. And I, yeah. I wrote a story for the street.com back one that was, I was at some financial conference. I wrote like a two-paragraph story about the incubator you never heard of. And within five minutes, the stock was up 30%, and I created a small nightmare. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's remarkable. And I mean, you know, and the reality is there's been a couple of studies done that show this. There's probably only, you know, sort of the three or four accelerators that you know best create the vast majority of the value in this marketplace, meaning that the likelihood of their graduates getting funded is just so much higher than anyone else's that, you know, you're really wasting your time going almost anywhere else. So this is a market that's not only going to sort of slow down, it's going to, you know, contract dramatically. Enterprise investments. The enterprise will strike back. Star Wars geek, too. Yeah, I mean, right? it's... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Gosh, it's time for another Star Wars analogy. Is it really too Thursday already? Um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And here's the, pro here's, the, here's the problem, right? The problem is that, for the most part, inside, of, inside the home and inside the small businesses, it's a brand new world, right? People are using software as a service. Many of the tools are mobile. And everything looks dramatically different than it did five and even ten years ago. Go back inside of the average Fortune 500 or Fortune, even Fortune 1000 organization, and it looks like it's still 1997. So much of what's the they're relying on are the same incumbent applications for things like ERP and other sorts of you know resource planning, manufacturing planning, uh, even basic manufacturing automation tools haven't changed much in the last you know 20 years. And so what you have is a giant. These things are not going to innovate. These are monolithic applications. So if there's a giant rip and replace opportunity, and it's beginning to finally happen as many of the technologies that first appeared in social are showing up now inside the enterprise. And you're really transforming the way people think about, you know, what's possible to do in the, in the enterprise and how cheaply you can do it, whether you can do it as a service. And that's really going to take, you know, take off you know, very, very quickly in 2013. It already began happening a year ago, but it's, people are going to finally notice in 2013 that right, you know, right. these elephants, they're dying out there. Yeah, maybe Workday, the most prominent example. You know, uh, and speaking of, of Workday yeah. and human resources, you talk about cash solving the, pr the talent problem that has plagued startups for some time. Right. I mean, this has been a, an ongoing issue, and specifically in Silicon Valley, where there's this incredible, you know, arguably dearth of talent, and that people haven't been able to find the right people, and uh, and you know, they're, they're constantly sort of questing around and asking friends to what they can find. And the reality is, is that you know, the best people flow to the best opportunities, and there's going to be less and less willingness to flow to, as as you know, top engineers, top marketing talent, to go anywhere other than the you know, the best funded companies that have come out of say the best accelerators. That all the other places that diluted the talent pool are all going to become non-competition and so you know cash is going to really rule over all of this and the competition for talent is actually going to become a lot easier in 2013 as a result. At the same time you're telling accelerators to cool their jets you're saying venture capital will rebound. Yeah, and I mean I think that's something that no like the Spanish Inquisition, right? Nobody expects it. So it's 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 no one expects this to happen. It's it's been, you know, 10 years now of watching this industry basically sort of repeatedly sort of impale itself on its own sword with too much money, bad deals, clean tech and all this sort of thing. And the reality is that the last three years have been among the best years, you know, since the pre-dot-com bubble period, certainly, um, for the industry. And, you know, we've sort of talked too much about Facebook and other offerings, but there have been many, many other offerings that have done very, very well for the industry and lots of other more recent things like what happened, you know, for example, you know, Avis's deal recently with respect to the, you know, the car rental marketplace. And, uh, you know, all of these, all of these things are going to, are feeding back in. And as a result, you heard people talking in the industry, LPs and GPs alike, the investors and partners and funds, saying that last year, 2012, delivered the best returns they've seen in a decade for some of the top tier funds, that will show right. up in the numbers over the next year or so, which will suck more capital into the industry, and you're going to see a you know, pretty remarkable resurgence. And yet, you'd, you'd also, uh, another prediction, you don't see this sort of ecosystem of the Silicon Valley of Turkey and the Silicon Beach of Los Angeles <laughs> and the Silicon Optics of Rochester, and you know, you don't see that continuing. 
Yeah, but that's been a that's been a great prediction to make for 20 years, and it always works. That's the great thing about that one is it's you know every year people are predicting new places that are going to you know sort of mimic the best of what's happened in the valley. It, it never works. It won't work. It'll continue not to work in large part because you know this is a winner take all marketplace and it's very very spiky where the best people want to work with the best people and they want to work at the cutting edge and that has been and will continue to be Silicon Valley. Whatever civic boosters around the world would like to see happen, it won't happen. All right, and finally, your last one, big data, no more. Yeah, big data was one of those great themes that was lovely if you were, you know, sort of a recently unemployed stats comp science graduate and wanted to put your, whatever those skills are, put those skills are to work, it's a great place to be. But the reality was it lacked an application, right? It turned too often into these giant sorts of, there's a giant haystack, there must be something fantastic in here somewhere. And for the most part, there isn't. And so what people are now demanding is, well, what's the purpose of all of this? What am I going to do with all this data? What's the specific application that's really useful to me, that pays back the investment on? And as a result, so these exploratory, big data efforts are largely going out the window and you know you're rapidly seeing sort of you know the the, the bloom come off that particular rose and there was a great piece Vinod uh, was it Vinod Koshal had out I think no, it was uh, yeah. Mike Moritz from Sequoia had up on LinkedIn recently making a similar argument. The point is we're sort of heading more towards n more deductive thinking, more small data, what's worked. Let's let's turn these things around and ask ourselves why we're doing it the way we are as opposed to saying, I think we can find you know remarkable lessons in doing this kind of large hadron collider approach to throwing all this data at the wall and right. see what we can extract. That that that's was two year or three year old thinking and it's not worked particularly well.